everyone uh, to the first uh, webinar of Knowledge Labs. It's uh, very exciting to be here and um, I hope that you will find this uh, webinar uh, helpful as we are all dealing with um, COVID-19 and the social distancing. So before we start, um, you know, this webinar is about negotiation. And the first thing that I uh, wanted to ask you is, um, you know, what is negotiation to you so that we can establish why effective negotiation is an essential skill during this time, uh, both for personal as well as uh, professional interactions that we have. So here are the results for uh, this group. So the first question that was asked is, what is negotiation? And many of you had uh, multiple answers for that, but the majority of you agreed that uh, negotiation is an interaction, any interaction that results in a decision. And you are 100% right, and we will talk more about that. Uh, this is something that we both um, use for both our personal as well as professional life. So 76% uh, of you are uh, using it both personally and professionally. And the last question is about how are you feeling during this time? And not surprisingly, the majority of you are having a lot of up and downs. And that is consistent with uh, other surveys that has been done and how people are feeling during this, um, during this um, times and uh, social distancing, uh, dealing with uncertainty. So to bring it back to negotiation, any interaction that we have that results in a decision is essentially a negotiation. It can be as simple as, uh, you know, what movie to watch uh, with your uh, partner, with your children, with your friends, all the way to very complex uh, business negotiations with multiple issues um, over a long period of time. But the same principle essentially applies, whether it is for our personal interactions or our professional interactions, any time that we have to come to a decision, we are engaging in negotiation. And to talk about uh, the ABCD of negotiation, there are a lot of uh, steps that have to take place before you get to the A of actual negotiation. The first thing that we always have to think about when we are in a negotiation interaction is what is our desired outcome? What are we hoping to get out of this interaction? And this is again, both for personal, professional, at any given time and more so now that we are practicing social distancing and many of our interaction may be um, virtual or more intimate uh, within our household. So the first thing that we have to think about is that, um, you know, what is our desired outcome? And to do that, we need to prepare and you, you need to think about it. And if this is something um, as simple as, you know, what movie to watch, you want to think about it. What is the purpose of this? Uh, why are we watching this movie? What do we want to get out of this? Is this about having a good time? Is it about a shared activity? Is it about keeping others busy? Is it about bonding? So we have to think about what are we hoping to get out of this interaction? And it may be just within a few seconds that you have to determine that and gather all the information you need to be very clear about what are you trying to get out of this negotiation interaction. The second part is that we have to think about the circumstances. And we're gonna talk more about this part because this is the part that has changed most in the last few weeks with social distancing and uh, the uncertainty that all of us are faced with. And to really understand the circumstances that this interaction is happening in, we have to apply our critical thinking and analyze the situation. What is going on for us, for the other person around us in the society, uh, within our household, within the business interactions? Uh, what is bothering each person? Uh, what state of mind uh, we are in? So we have to think about the circumstances that this interaction is happening because that is going to impact the, each individual response to the situation. Which brings us to the third component being the B and that's the beneficiary analysis. And for any negotiation, we have to think about who are the people that are involved? 
So you may be having an interaction and negotiating with uh, your coworker, but there are others that are involved in this negotiation, their manager, your manager, um, other team members, uh, a supplier, a customer. So you have to really be aware of who are the different beneficiaries for this interaction. And you have to apply your emotional intelligence and awareness to think about how each party is feeling, first of all, who are the different uh, beneficiaries, how each of them are feeling, how are they going to respond, what each person wants from this interaction, and how does all of that align with one another. So you have to really think about everybody that is involved in this interaction, whether you are directly interacting with them or not. And this goes for personal as well as professional. So during these times, you know, for those who have children and you're at home, uh, the parents may be in conflict or may be negotiating about how their uh, child should be spending their time or when they should be focusing on their homework. And even in that, the child may not be involved in the negotiation, but they are a beneficiary to that negotiation. And when we talk about professionally, again, we may be interacting with one party, but other departments within the organization, the suppliers and the, the, the customers are all part of that negotiation. And then at the end, we come to the actual negotiation. And that's where our uh, communication skills, our influential um, tactics are going to be useful in how we are going to communicate with one another and all of those that are involved and persuade them and to come up with the best alternative. So three kind of stages of negotiation is that the first stage is we ask. We ask for information. We ask ourselves about why are we entering this interaction? What are we hoping to get out of it? We ask about other party. We ask about what is happening, the circumstances. And then we take that information and we have to analyze it. We have to put everything into perspective about the people, about the circumstances, about the desired outcome, about alternative uh, approaches. And based on that, we need to adapt our approach. And as new information comes in, we need to adjust how we are approaching the situation. So we may walk into a scenario thinking that we know what we want and what the other party wants. And as we are interacting with them, new information may come. And this is happening a lot now because with the current circumstances, a lot of assumptions that we may have had in the past are changing. And those who are able to adopt their approach and think about different alternatives are the ones that would be most successful in their interactions to collaborate with others and get to the desired outcome that they have had in mind. So from the four that we have discussed, the one that has been impacted most during uh, COVID-19 and uh, social distancing, working from home, um, what is happening within the economy, is the circumstances. The circumstances that now we are interacting with one another has changed significantly during this time. At the societal level, we are now in a state of emergency. So everybody is thinking about what is happening next. There is um, social distancing that's happening, it has taken us away from how we used to live and now our interactions have changed. They have become more ritual with uh, those that we interact with professionally or are part of our extended uh, family or friends. And they have become more intimate with those people that we are living with because we have to interact 24 seven every day, which is different than how it may have been in the past. And the level of uncertainty in the society as a whole is much higher now. So the circumstances that we are in is different. And what that means for us at the individual level is that our routine has changed. So what we used to do in the past, get up in the morning, you know, go for exercise, have breakfast, uh, for some people go to work, take children to school, uh, whatever that we used to do, we cannot do it anymore. And this change of routine has an impact on our state of mind. That added to the social distancing and the uncertainty, 
a lot of us are feeling more stressed. We may be experiencing more up and down. Uh, we have to uh, think about alternative ways to manage our life. And that has put us in a different state of mind compared to before. Now, this is more observable for us, for those that are in the same household as us, and we are interacting with them regularly. But this is also true for anyone that you would be interacting with professionally, because they have their own challenges in their own world, which may become part of their interaction with you. And as the level of uncertainty has increased, so has our tolerance. And that is something that will also impact how we are interacting with one another and how we may be overcoming conflict. So uh, fantastic. So about 50% uh, of you feel that you are experiencing same level of conflict as uh, you were in the past. So there are no major uh, issues. 26% of you feel that you are having more conflict and 16% uh, of you feel that you're having uh, less uh, conflict compared uh, to the past. So in terms of uh, what the conflicts that you are having is, um, the highest number is for disruption while working from home. And we'll talk about that because this is definitely a challenge where uh, multiple uh, people in a household may be working from home and um, they may get disrupted, uh, whether they are by, by their children, by their partners, uh, by their roommates, uh, by their parents, whoever that uh, is uh, in the same household as them. And the second issue is the assignment of household chores. So about 27% uh, of you are having challenges there. 33% are other issues. Um, maybe during question and answer, we would get more insight on what those issues are. And um, the majority of you uh, have indicated that you're showing more flexibility um, to resolve these conflicts compared to pre-COVID-19. And that's the good news. And that's one of the things that we're going to talk about uh, is uh, during these times, given the circumstances, um, it is best to show more flexibility because at the end of the day, we want uh, to make sure that we are making this as easy as possible for ourselves, as well as uh, those around us uh, that we care for or we have a personal or professional relationship with. So when we talk about conflict resolution, there are always two competing priorities in how we are going to overcome conflict. And those priorities are the outcome of the interaction that we are having, so the agreement that we come to and how important that agreement is. And the more important it is, uh, the higher we are going to be on this table and the less important the issue or the agreement or the outcome is for us, we're going to be on the lower part of this table. The second issue that's always at stake is our relationship with the people that we're interacting with or having conflict with. And the more important that relationship is, we will be more to the right of the screen, focusing on collaborating and accommodating and the less important that relationship is, we would be more on the left, competing or avoiding. Now, during these times, we are more likely to be to the right, because if we are having conflict at home, it is certainly with people that we care for and the relationship with them is extremely important for us, or we may be having professional conflict with our coworkers or people that we are working with virtually that we are going to continue working with and that relationship is also important to us and we want to make sure that while we are reaching an agreement we are uh, treasuring our relationship with them so we're more likely to be focused on collaborating or accommodating now if you want to see what uh, your national style is uh, you can uh, take an assessment to know what is your conflict resolution style at um at a, uh, at a site that uh, I have uh, put down here, but there are two issues when we talk about uh, resolving conflict. One is, what is your natural approach? And each of us are more comfortable to approach using one of these um, 
uh, tactics. So some people are just naturally more collaborative and uh, for every interaction that they have, whether this is someone that they're going to be uh, working with or seeing again, or it's a one-time um, interaction, they want to be collaborative. They want to make sure that they leave a positive impression, that they are um, getting what they want, but at the same time, everybody is uh, walking away from this interaction happy and they're going to be more collaborative, asking about what the other party wants and uh, reaching a mutual agreement. Some people are naturally more competing and they are competitive in their approach. And uh, even if they're interacting with people that they care for, they are going to focus more on getting what they want. Now, during these times, that is a risky place to be in because we are interacting with people that uh, we care for in our household, as well as long-term relationships for uh, our professional interaction. And if we really continue to emphasize on getting what we want, we may be jeopardizing our relationship. But some people are just naturally more competitive and they're going to push as much as they can. There are others who are more comfortable to avoid. Uh, they do not like conflict and those are the ones that would most likely just walk away at the time of conflict. Now, this would have been easier to do when we could just walk out. If we were having conflict, we could just go walk um, and uh, you know, uh, get some fresh air and come back. And then we could uh, just continue with our lives as usual. During this times, that may be harder to just avoid conflict and the likelihood of having conflict is higher. So it is not as easy to just walk away because something else may come and this may build up to create more challenges. And there are others who are more accommodating and naturally they uh, don't emphasize on what they want and they care about making the other parties happy and they will agree with what is being asked of them and they will just go with the flow. And then in the middle, we have people who compromise. And those are the people that are willing to do something if the other party is willing to do something else in return. Now, we all have our natural conflict resolution. However, for any given situation, depending on the importance of the relationship and the outcome, we have to think about what is the best approach for this given situation. And as I said, during these times, we are hoping for everyone to be more on the collaborative and accommodating side compared to competing and avoiding. So when in conflict at home, one of the things uh, that you wanna think about before responding is asking yourself the repo. What does that mean? So if you are faced with conflict, you wanna think about what is the underlying reason for this conflict? And this is very important because in the current circumstances where there are a lot of external stress factors, there may not be a conflict between the two people, but what has caused the conflict is this current circumstances. So before responding, you want to analyze what is this conflict about? And you wanna ask, is this really about the issue that you're having conflict over, or is that just an excuse? Is it because of the current circumstances? Is it that the other person is um, you know, acting or behaving or asking something that has caused this conflict? Is it because of your own frustration and how you are behaving? Are the underlying reasons factors that are outside of our control? So you want to ask these questions because that will help you analyze the issue and to kind of think about what is the best approach to overcome this conflict. The second thing you wanna ask yourself is how important is this issue for you? The issue that you're having conflict over, are you gonna care about it in an hour? And when we are frustrated and when we are at home or we feel that we don't have control, we are more likely to hang on to an issue that we have conflict over and not let go, not because the issue itself is important, but because by emphasizing to get what you want, you will feel a greater sense of control over the situation. So it's important to pause and ask how important this issue really is. Is it gonna matter tomorrow? What are the impacts of this issue? 
if you let it go or if you just accept what the other party is asking or if you be flexible what is the actual implications what's the impact is this going to uh, change uh, something very important or is it just going to simply make the other person happier or it's going to help you calm down the situation or resolve the conflict so you have to think about how important the issue really is to you the third thing that you want to think about is the other person's perspective how are they feeling and what else is going on? So if somebody is having a tough interaction on, uh, on phone or um, you know, at work, before they would be at a different physical space and by the time they would interact with you, they may have been able to manage how they were feeling. But today, for those who are working from home and there are other members that are working from home or not, even if one person is working from home, after having a conflict or a hard day, they are not able to cool off and interact with you in a more neutral state. As a result of that, they may come to the interaction uh, with higher degree of frustration than they would usually. So you wanna think about uh, how are they feeling? What else is going on with, their, uh, uh, with them at that moment? And how important and urgent this issue is for them? And how flexible can they be? And uh, you wanna, think about their perspective so that you can decide how to respond to the situation and again before responding the last thing you want to analyze is what are other alternatives so if you are in conflict and you may think that you want what you want the other party wants what they want and there's no way out you have to think creatively about what are the other alternatives can this decision be delayed can you uh, reach your goal through an alternative mean? Can the other person reach what they want through an alternative mean? So you have to take this conflict and change it into an interaction that you're thinking of other alternatives and possibilities to reach an agreement. And again, during this times, because most people have up and downs, when you feel the other person is at a down moment or they are more frustrated than you may be, it's a good time to be more flexible and try to reach an agreement. So before responding to a conflict, just pause for a moment and go through the REPA, the reason, the importance, other person perspective, and potential alternatives to reach an agreement. So with that, um, I have been talking uh, a lot. So we are going to send you out to breakout rooms. And this is a scenario that we want you to discuss. So we want you to think about that you're not feeling well. And you go to the kitchen to make yourself a fresh orange juice. You're thirsty, you're not feeling well, you really want that orange juice. So you go to the kitchen and you see that your partner is cooking soup for you and has the four whole oranges on the table as part of their ingredients to make the soup. Now, you ask to take the four oranges to make your juice and your partner express that they need the four oranges to make their soup. You look into the fridge and there are no more oranges. Now, given the current circumstances, nobody wants to just go out to get more oranges. So you're stuck with the four oranges that are at home. What we want to do is that get into your groups and we're going to give you five minutes to think about this scenario and discuss in your breakout, how would you reach an agreement over the four oranges? We want you to be mindful of how are you going to start the conversation? What are you going to ask? And when you come back, we can discuss it as a group. How did you reach an agreement in this very real situation that you may be faced with? Okay, fantastic. Let's take a look at the results. Um, so only one team uh, took all four oranges. Uh, so that's, uh, that's good. About 16% uh, had um, the partner take the four oranges. 40% divided it by two. So each person took uh, two oranges. And um, some had uh, you know one take one orange and the other person takes three oranges and uh 20 percent uh use the oranges to make the juice and then give the peel uh to their partner uh to use as a taste for the soup and 11 percent did not reach an agreement 
Fantastic. So we'll talk about what that means. But before we do that, um, the way that most people started the conversation was asking their partner uh, how they were going to use the oranges in the soup. So that's a fantastic start. Uh, 6% told their uh, partner that they just want uh, to make the orange juice and they really want the oranges. Uh, 20% expressed their appreciation that their partner is making them soup and just left, didn't even ask for the uh, uh, oranges. And uh, they, no one told their partner that they don't really need the oranges, which is great. So nobody uh, thought that they know better than the other person. And 20% offered to take two oranges and leave two for them. And that's how they started. And about 10% had an other approach and nobody got frustrated at the situation. So this is a great, great start. So let's talk about, um, you know, what are, uh, what are the implications of this? This is an example that you walk into a situation and you feel that there is only um, one solution. You think that there are limited number of oranges and uh, yeah, the majority of you divided it by two. So two people took two, uh, one person took uh, the first two orange and the second person took the other two orange. And this is a great example that we think we have to compromise um, and meet halfway, which is really not the best solution. So um, this is a case that has been, uh, has been studied and shared with many people, but the best approach in this situation is really asking why each person needs the orange for. And 44% of you have started your conversation by asking them, why do they need the oranges? And in this case, um, they really just needed it for the taste and the peel would have been enough for them to make the soup. So if you took the two and you made your orange juice, the peel and everything is going to be unused and you're not going to have a full glass of orange juice because you need four uh, oranges to make the glass full. And they're not going to have enough peel and possibly the inside of the orange may not be used in their soup. Now, this is, uh, of course, it could have uh, different uh, outcomes depending on how one makes a soup. But the lesson in this situation is often when we are faced with a conflicting scenario, we may think that both parties want the same thing. And in this case, that is not the scenario. You want the inside of the orange to make the orange juice, and all they want is part of the orange to include it in their ingredients to give the soup a taste of orange. So you could both use the four oranges depending on how you're interacting with another and how you're getting to the core of what each individual needs. So when we're talking about negotiation, People often come to the table with a position. A position in this case would be you want four oranges to make an orange juice and your partner wants four oranges to make the soup. However, if you ask questions of why you need this, and an example of this would be, you know, even at work, if you request somebody to send you a file and they say they're busy and they can't finish it to send it to you, and uh, they're taking a position that they can't uh, respond to you right now, and you're taking the position that you want this right now. That is the position you're taking. But if you ask questions, you may be able to understand the underlying interest each party has. Why did your partner need the oranges? Not for what is inside, but rather the peel just for the tasting. And it's an important question to ask, for you to move to the actual interests of each party. And then to build on that, every negotiation starts with an underlying need. And to reach an agreement, we need to understand that underlying need. And that's why we go back to ask questions, ask about what you want, what you think, but also ask about the other parties, priorities and interests, analyze this information and adapt your approach based on the responses that you get. Now, let's switch over to professional negotiation. Now, during these times that we are practicing social distancing, um, I assume that most of your professional interactions, if you're not part of the essential services, is virtual. And with that, you are engaging in e-negotiation. 
So you have to interact with people, not face to face, but with email, text, phone, uh, conference call, or a video conferencing. Now, it's important for you to choose the right method to engage in e-negotiation. And you want to ask yourself two questions. How simple or complex the issues that you're discussing are? If it's a simple issue, then writing may be the right approach. If it's a complex issue, then you need more personal interaction and more immediate response. In which case, a phone call or a video uh, conference may be more appropriate. The other question that you want to ask yourself is how official or informal this interaction is. So if you are just um, having a, a discussion with your friends about something and it's very informal over a simple issue about, um, you know, uh, what are you going, when are you going to have a virtual meetup, then you can simply text them because it's a simple issue and it's informal. But if you're dealing with a supplier, a coworker, uh, your manager, uh, it's something that is more formal and you need to officially document this, uh, but it's a simple issue. You don't really need to book a call to have that conversation. Then email would be more appropriate. You can just send them an email, simple issue, uh, but you get the response and the interaction documented. Now, if it is an issue that is more complex, but you can uh, you know, just have a phone call to discuss it. And often, if you start an issue that's simple and you may be going back and forth in email, but then you think, okay, there are too many emails. If you pass three emails going back and forth, it's time to pick up the phone and have a conversation because the issue has now become more complex than you anticipated. So by having a phone call, you can clarify it. If it is still official, following the phone call, you must put it in writing and email it to the other person to conclude the agreement and to make sure that it is documented. So you, because it was complex, you're having the phone call, but now you can email it to uh, make it official. And if it's a very complex issue, and it's really um, official and it's important and there are multiple issues, there are multiple people, then having a video conference is the best alternative that you have right now um, instead of an in-person meeting that may have been uh, the best approach. Now, there are uh, cases that we would have been having a video conference before social distancing, for instance, if it is a negotiation with people in uh, different cities, different countries, um, the best alternative of discussing and coming to an agreement for a multi-issue, multi-party negotiation would be video conferencing. But during this time also, that is your best alternative. Now you wanna think about each of these approaches and choose your medium of communication correctly. Because if you're having a formal conversation via text, you're not going to get the best results. Each of these methods come with their pro and cons. Text is great when it's quick and it's short to the point and you can just write it and email is fantastic for a simple issue. You just send it, but you need to be careful how you're writing and how you are reading and interpreting the message that has come to you. Sometimes we may read something in a rush and don't really understand the meaning or the uh, intention of the message. So you want to make sure you're reading your email out loud and you are understanding the message that it was intended for. And when you want to respond, you want to think about how to respond uh, to be effective. And often email is also a good method if you want to buy some time. So you want to engage the other party, but you can't make a decision. So you will acknowledge that you have received their message, but you don't have to make a decision right on the spot and you can buy yourself some time to consult with others, to think about it before responding. With the phone call, it's uh, more personal, but the challenge is, especially when you have multiple people on the call, you don't know when someone will start talking and you may talk over one another and because um, there is no um, uh, uh, nonverbal communication that you can see, 
uh, just the tone of the person, they may change that uh, because of what's happening around them. So you may be in a place that you can't hear them well, so you may raise your tone and that may be misunderstood. So you wanna make sure if you're having a phone conversation to discuss something and reach an agreement, you are in a place that you can speak well and you can hear the other party and you can manage your interaction and your tone. And video conferencing is uh, most uh, personable. The challenge is that many times people forget that they're on the video. And I personally know I have been on a lot of calls that people forget, everybody can see their facial expression and uh, you know they may be uh, changing their, uh, the way that they're looking at something or expressing how they're feeling in the video without actually discussing it. So you wanna make sure that again, first you're in a place that you can speak um, in, a, in the right uh, manner. There's not a lot of distractions around you, but also just be mindful that you are being observed. And uh, one uh, thing that is helpful when you're having video conferencing uh, for the people that are on the same side, if there are multiple parties, uh, you can have uh, you know, your side chat discussion or even text discussion with other people that are on your side to make sure you're all aligned. Uh, because you may be saying something and others cannot um, uh, predict. And it's better to have a different method to make sure parties on the same uh, side are aligned with one another. Now, the major differences between virtual negotiation and in-person negotiation is that, um, you know, when we meet with people, there's just a higher level of trust. We're more likely to uh, feel comfortable and we trust how we are reading the room more. Um, that is uh, at a lower level when we're having a virtual negotiation. The other thing is that, um, you know, when you're meeting in person, we spend more time asking people how they are, how they're doing and um, build that report. Uh, that is lower in virtual communication and people get more uh, straight to the point. However, uh, the time that's spent on the actual negotiation may be longer virtually because there is more room for misinterpretation uh, and people feel uh, more, um, they need to emphasize the, uh, the point more, as well as we are asking more questions uh, to ensure that we're all on the same page. So you need to allocate more time for a virtual negotiation compared to a meeting in person. The quality of the agreement really depends on the issues. You could have high quality virtual negotiation agreements um, if you manage it right. So there's no right or wrong way. Uh, of course, uh, the more uh, uh, personal it is, the greater the trust, but that doesn't mean you cannot have high quality agreements uh, virtually. And uh, the last uh, thing you wanna think about is that the risk of misinterpretation and misunderstanding is higher in virtual negotiation uh, because we communicate, 60% uh, of our communication is actually nonverbal. verbal um, 30% is how we say things and 10% is about what we say. So when you are um, negotiating uh, via email or text, uh, about 90% of the communication is not there when you're negotiating on the phone, you can hear the person's tone, but you're still at 40%. And when you are negotiating uh, in a video uh, conference, you can only see the person's face, uh, not a full body. So you're at half of the body language uh, can be uh, transferred. So you are uh, looking at 70%, uh, but when you're in person, you can see all aspects of the person, their body movement, their facial expression, their eye contact. Uh, so uh, of course there is less room for misinterpretation compared to virtual negotiation. But this is the world that we are living in and uh, we need to just apply the best practices uh, to have collaboration during this pandemic, being at home. Um, so what you wanna think about is at every interaction that you're having, acknowledge the current circumstances and show genuine interest about how others are feeling. And just be aware that everybody is having their own challenges and they are going to be bringing those challenges in the interaction that they're having with you. So you need to be more flexible. Uh, you need to be realistic about your goals and the importance of what needs to happen. People are dealing with different priorities and um, you know, what may have been a priority uh, prior to this time 
may not be a priority right now. So you want to be realistic about what we are asking people and uh, what we want uh, to get done and how important it is. If it is not important, if it can be delayed, uh, if it can change, uh, now is the time to show flexibility and adapt our expectation and our approach based on the current circumstances and ask a lot of questions because as I said earlier, there's more room for misinterpretation. So you wanna ask questions during your interaction to make sure that you are getting all the information and uh, you are eliminating the misunderstanding as much as you can and just show more flexibility and adapt your approach when necessary. Have more compassion toward people and what we are going through. Uh, we talked about how the current circumstances has impacted the society, but each individual and their routine and their behavior and their state of mind. And you want to allocate uh, more time uh, for ritual uh, socialization and building relationship with people that you're reaching, uh, you're trying to reach an agreement with. Uh, this is a time of uh, adaptability. And um, that is not just related uh, to how you're dealing with your issues, uh, but also how you're interacting with other people and how you are um, reaching an agreement uh, with them. So with that, uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, the high level of some of the key points that I wanted to share with you to um, maybe help you better manage your ritual interactions and uh, reaching an agreement uh, with others. And at this point, we would uh, like to open it up for uh, questions that uh, the participants may have. Okay, the first question is, how do I separate work from home when work is sitting in the corner of my living room? How do I concentrate better when another person in my household is also working from home right beside me? Uh, that's an excellent question. And that's a challenge uh, because, um, you know, uh, often, uh, work was uh, a place that we would go to and we would just uh, we would just leave. So one of the best practices is to uh, choose one spot, which is preferably, if possible, not your bedroom, um, to sit at and have your work station in that place every day so that your brain will start associating that location with your workspace. If there is a dining room, if there's a family room, that you could sit in the corner, but it's a place that you can always um, use uh, for your work and uh, your brain is going to be, uh, uh, be uh, kind of uh, connecting that place with your work. Now, the other challenge is, um, you know, if the, it's a smaller space and both parties have to be in the same space. And when one speaks, the other person uh, can hear them and it's distracting. So one thing is, you know, having earphones if you are um, if you're on a call to eliminate uh, the other parties that are on the call with you um, from uh, your household, uh, but also uh, trying to see if you could um, uh, have different times for your meetings. And what I have seen a lot of um, couples are doing now is one of them is trying to uh, book all of their meetings in the morning. And then the other one is trying to book their meetings in the afternoon so that they don't have to be on call simultaneously uh, at the same time. Uh, so that's one way is, you know, you kind of have a discussions of uh, when one can do their louder work where the other person is not. Um, the other thing is that because work is more flexible, uh, some people are, you know, one uh, who have especially children, one person is uh, kind of looking after the children in the morning while the other person has their calls in the afternoon, they have their calls and uh, the other person is, um, uh, you know, taking uh, care of the children. And then in the evening, the other party is catching up on their non-interactive uh, work and they try to balance that. But uh, th these are the, the three things is number one, have a dedicated workspace. Number two, and negotiate with your partner so that you can manage your time in a way that you don't overlap when you have louder uh, work. And number uh, three is that you would assign other chores of the house to make it easiest for the other person while they are in their interactive um, work time. Okay, great. Next question. What strategies or suggestions can you offer to employees whose management is skeptical about working from home? Proving or demonstrating your effectiveness? 
So that's a, that's a great uh, example. Now there was actually, I was reading, there was an actually a study done that showed in reality, people are more productive uh, when they're at home because, because of that skepticism that uh, exists. A lot of people are trying to show uh, their value. Um, some are sending more emails. They're trying to be more, uh, more present. Uh, and a part of that is our perception. People um, perceive others not seeing their value. So the first part is to distinguish whether really the management is being skeptical or it is our own perception that they're being skeptical. So that's the, that's the first thing. The second issue is that um, you know, if they are being skeptical by holding regular meetings with them, like just touch point 15 minutes, touch point on a weekly basis, to go over what you're working on, uh, what uh, you will be working on, and then the next week, giving the status of what you have worked on and uh, what you will be working on next. So by keeping that interaction, it is really helpful. It is not suggested for people to just send uh, non-value emails just because they want to show that they're working something. Having dedicated touching points um, is really helpful. If your management uh, has not set them up, I would suggest for you to set that up and that way you would do that. But remember, part of that is our own perception. Um, so unless so, uh, the management has uh, questioned the quality of your work or the, um, the productivity of your work, um, you don't need to uh, feel that you need to justify yourself. And the best way is just uh, keeping them informed and having regular check-in points for them to see that you're getting the work done. What conflicts can potentially arise when one partner has a job and the other has school? So that's uh, that's a great example. Now there are uh, you know, and, and I uh, try to be very uh, mindful that not the situation is not that both parties are actually working. Um, there are different combination. It could be that uh, one party is working, the other one is not. They never have, or one party may have lost their job. Or in this uh, question that you have, is if one is uh, studying and the other one is uh, working. So one of, the, one of the ways to overcome the conflict is that for the one that is studying, they probably have more flexibility on how to manage their time. Because if they have to study and prepare for an assignment or, an, uh, or arrange with that, uh, for the parts that they are working on their own, um, they have more flexibility to do it later in the day or earlier in the day or during uh, downtimes. Whereas if someone is working and they have to be present uh, from nine to five and work hours, they have less flexibility. So number one is be mindful of that. Um, the second one is that a lot of people um, are working, uh, especially those studying, you're working with other individuals. And um, some people feel that they have to accept whatever time has been assigned to them. Um, one way to manage it better is when you are setting up um, group meetings uh, to ask everyone if they would be okay with a different time, if they would be uh, flexible to have it at a downtime. Because uh, a lot of the pressure that's coming is that we feel we have no control over it and that's the time that the group wants to meet or that's the time they want to have the meeting. Uh, going back to what I said, everybody should show flexibility now. And if you really have uh, over overlap with the person that you are uh, living with, maybe you could ask your group if they're okay to change a meeting time or a deadline and uh, uh, negotiate with them on that part. So uh, think broader, not everything is set in stone and other, you would be surprised how others may be uh, flexible. Next question. How do you negotiate salary um, and compensation without leaving the conversation feeling bitter or feeling unsatisfied? Okay, so that's a, that's a great question that doesn't just apply to now, but generally, uh, you know, having compensation negotiation is one of the most difficult conversation with individuals and most real because everybody that works at some point has uh, negotiated the compensation. Uh, so the, first, the, the thing about negotiation is that 
Number one is you have to find your style. Uh, going back to what is your conflict resolution style, if naturally you are, let's say, a person that's accommodating and you go into a conversation, you don't feel what the deal that is being offered is fair and you push back, um, you may not be doing anything that uh, is meant to ruin the relationship, but because your natural state is to be accommodating, you will feel unnatural and you may leave the conversation a little bit uh, bitter. So the first thing is to kind of know what you are comfortable with doing. So that's the first part. The second part is that when you go into a compensation negotiation, you have to prepare for it. Um, you have to ask for something that you sincerely believe is fair. And to do that, you have to think about what is your desired outcome and you need to have the backup for what you're asking. So if you feel that for someone with your experience doing this job, this is a fair compensation and compensation has multiple factors. It's salary is part of that. Um, the uh, vacation time is part of that. Bonus is part of that. Um, uh, you know, a, any uh, expense reimbursement such as car, uh, phone is part of that. Um, assignments you work on are part of that. The group you are in, there are multiple factors in that negotiation. So you want to think about what is it that you're asking and you have to believe what you're asking is fair. And to do that, you have to do your research. You have to compare how other people are getting compensated with the same background, education, expertise as you and build your case. And the more you believe in what you're asking, the better you're going to feel after the negotiation, regardless of the results. During the negotiation, you want to focus on the fairness and that what you're asking is reasonable. And um, you have to, you know, prop questions from the other person. Do they see value in you? Or how have other people in this role been compensated? Uh, so that you can get information from them and put them in the mindset of what is fair within the boundaries that you're asking. Um, so this is, I mean, compensation negotiation is a, uh, is a very uh, uh, comprehensive discussion, but I hope, uh, you know, to summarize there's like three points, uh, know what your style is and approach it some way that you're comfortable, um, know what you want and look at multiple factors that are involved in compensation package, not just the salary. And number three, do your research. So make sure that what you're asking is fair and help the other person get into that mindset as well. Okay. How do I increase the level of trust over virtual negotiation? So that's, uh, so that's the part, depending on who you are negotiating with, because if it is someone that you do have an existing relationship, um, there are uh, some research that's being done right now that uh, the virtual interaction is actually bringing some people closer to one another because uh, now you going back to the first question of you can't separate your home and work. These people are in your home. You can hear them in your home. You can uh, see them in your home. So that automatically is creating a closer level of attraction for you. If this is someone that's absolutely new and you have zero background with, um, you want to start by asking questions, you know, uh, how they are dealing, acknowledge the current circumstances, and generally care about what's going on with them rather than, um, you know, just saying, so how are you? And then look uh, the other way around uh, and not show them the attention uh, that is fair. So by asking questions and trying to learn a little bit more about them and then sharing information, um, you know, the one uh, trust comes from uh, the three sources of trust. Uh, one is that, you know, some people are just more likely to trust others. And that would be true, whether it's virtual or in person. The second one is that we have a higher level of trust uh, for people of a certain uh, background or uh, occupation and, uh, uh, you know, th th based on what we know about them, not from personal experience, but uh, from uh, what they have done in the past. And the third one is a trust that's built based on our own, own interaction. And that's the one that we need to manage in ritual negotiation. 
And to do that, the more you ask questions about them and the more you share, uh, the closer you become and you can build a trust. The other part is that, um, you know, just uh, as difficult it is to interact with people, it is also easier for people to commit to something virtually and not follow through. Because the more impersonal it is, um, the easier it becomes for people not to follow through. So to build a trust, you need to make sure that you continue to make uh, commitments that you can follow through. And the more you do that, the higher your degree of trust is going to be. So if you uh, commit to send an email, something as simple as that, or to follow up or to share something and you actually follow through that, uh, there is going to be greater um, trust built eventually between you and those people. For those that you do know in the past, now is an opportunity to uh, get to know them a little bit more and uh, you know, again, ask about how they're doing and be genuine about it. And that uh, you can build a closer relationships uh, using that. Okay. Do you have tips for catching yourself if you notice you are slipping to your default negotiation style and need to come back to a balanced approach? Yes. So, um, as, uh, absolutely. So as I said, you know, you, uh, the first step is for you to know what's your style. Like that is essential for you to know what is your national style. Because if you know you're someone that's going to nationally avoid conflict uh, or accommodate uh, or get competitive or be collaborative, you need to have that awareness walking into every situation. So that's the first step. Then the second step is that as you do that uh, with that awareness, constantly when you're trying to make small decisions in that interaction, ask yourself, why are you making this decision? So if you're someone that avoids and the, the other party proposes something and you just don't wanna deal with the conflict and you're like, okay, uh, I'm not going to uh, say anything. Uh, I'm just gonna let it go. You need to pause and think about why are you doing this? And go back to, you know, what is the outcome that you're looking for? How important is it for you? And what, how is the relationship and how important is it for you? So by going back to those two questions of, how important is this relationship? How important is this outcome? Then you are less likely to, in this case, to avoid if the issue is important to you. You can't just avoid it because what are the consequences of not discussing this? Um, so you have to be aware and it, it takes practice to be conscious about every small decision that's being made in your negotiation interaction. You must uh, come back to your style and ask why are you accepting, not accepting, or competing. If you're competing, come back and say, am I really competing because this issue is important to me? Or am I really being assertive because I just like to be assertive and um, it's not that important of an issue? So you have to come back to those questions and watch how you are responding in order to apply the best approach for that situation. What approach or advice can you share when negotiating with someone who is extremely competitive or aggressive? So that's the, that's the hardest, the hardest uh, group to um, reach an agreement with uh, from your perspective. Uh, I mean, those who avoid are, uh, they have their own difficulties, but when someone is very competitive and they get assertive, um, what we need to do is we need to bring awareness to them. So if they are really being assertive, sometimes they don't realize uh, how harmful their behavior can be. And it's, um, it's good to, you know, again, to pause and go back to them and say, you know, do, do you realize the impact of what you're suggesting? Or if we did do this, this is how it's going to be. And ask them, is that what they want? Is that what they're looking for? And uh, by bringing that awareness to them, they will learn to self-correct. Because a lot of time, those that are naturally competitive, they're just being assertive, uh, not really because of that issue, but that's because that's the natural state that they get in. And if they are not having that awareness, then you need to bring that awareness to them and take what they're saying, put it into perspective for them and give it back to them. You know, how would you feel if somebody that you know would be offered this deal? How would you feel if this is, or do you understand by doing this, uh, you know, 
for instance, by putting this pressure on the timeline, we are asking people to prioritize their work over their family, for instance. Is that what you're asking? So by rephrasing it and raising awareness, um, it would be effective to do that. What tips do you have about negotiating healthy boundaries with your coworkers with respect to working from home and work hours? How can you increase quality of work when you are the only one working from home with young children and lots of interruptions? Um, so just, just to clarify this question, is it that like you have children and others do not, or is it that other you're the only one that's actually working from home? I believe the context is that um, on the team they are working on, um, they are the only one working at home with young children. Okay, okay, great. So again, uh, part of that is, uh, you know, because for this to work, it's not just you, everybody that you're interacting with need to be mindful of the current situation. So that's what we were talking about for, for us collectively, um, to have a better experience working from home during this social distancing. Everybody needs to be mindful of how others are uh, feeling or what are the challenges and what they are dealing with. Uh, so one way is, uh, you know, if you think about it, how, what, what is it that would, uh, for instance, make them skeptical and put more pressure on? Is it because they are assuming that you are not going to get the work done? Uh, so you need to kind of, take a closer look at what are their concerns and why are they having additional pressure? So that's one thing to understand their side. Then think about how can you give them the comfort that, uh, you know, yes, uh, during these times you cannot be available from nine to 10 because that's the time that you have to, um, you know, attend to your uh, children, but uh, you can make up that time from eight to 9 p.m. And by having that transparency and telling them that, you know, from this time to this time, I'm not going to be available, but I will be available instead at this time. And I will take a look at this during that time uh, would give people a comfort because most uh, people get frustrated when they don't know what's happening. And if they don't know that, uh, you know, you're not going to be accessible during nine to 10 AM in this case, um, then that worries them. But if you're transparent and letting them know that this is it, and at the end of the day, you are going to do your work, it's just you need more flexibility, then people are more likely to accept and be flexible to that. But also, because we're working from home, we feel that if we get a message at like 6 p.m., we have to respond. Well, no, if your usual hours was not that, um, don't feel obligated that you have to respond to that because that can create a lot of frustration because uh, you're always putting out fires and it's never ending and people have different schedules working from home. Um, so it would be good to set the rules of engagement. Like some of the teams that I have worked with uh, during this time is that uh, I have engaged with different uh, work groups to set the rules, what we call rules of engagement. You know, that during this time, a 24 hour response is reasonable. If it is an urgent matter because of uh, the nature of the job that people are in, um, you know, they provide IT support uh, for organization or something that's more urgent, that they can uh, have another way of communication only for urgent matters. Like for instance, can call them uh, so that they would attend to this. But other than that, by discussing this with your coworkers and having a rules of engagement of when each person will respond and uh, what are the circumstances would really help. The more transparent we are, the more uh, clarity we have around each person uh, work and what they bring to the table and their uh, um, constraints, uh, the better the interaction can be. Okay, great. So we have two more questions for you. Okay. One is, how do I negotiate getting a job during the pandemic, considering cover letter and interview considerations for working from home during the pandemic? So that's a, that's a challenge right now. You know, uh, now some companies are starting to, because uh, there was a few weeks that everybody uh, was freezing everything. And uh, the reality is that many people uh, are losing their jobs and many people are looking for new jobs. So there are companies that are hiring during this uh, pandemic um, and you need to identify them. Now, as they are, 
even before this, the first point of contact with the organization was your resume and your CV or your profile on LinkedIn, however, that they did it in the past, it was not face-to-face. -face. So that has not changed now. What has changed is that there may be more people looking for jobs. So you need to think about how can you customize uh, and, and even sending your, your uh, um, resume or your CV or your profile is a form of negotiation because they have to look at it and they're making a decision. So you want to give them all the information they need to make that decision to move you to the next stage. So you need to um, you know, look at, uh, be more specific about the job that you're looking for and possibly make changes to your uh, LinkedIn profile, to your, um, to your resume, to be more aligned with the exact type of job that you are looking for. The other thing is that and now would be a good time to use your network to find jobs uh, because, uh, because most companies that would be hiring now are not able to see you face to face. They tend to be more comfortable with those that uh, come as a reference or that they have interacted with before. But to engage that, you cannot just go to people and say, oh, I'm looking for a job, can you help me? You need to think about what value can you bring to the table to help them think of you. So you may want to start reaching out to your network uh, with uh, you know, something that has value to them. If you uh, look at what they're doing right now, some of the challenges the organization may be facing, and sending them a piece of information, an article, a, a video, a, some information that has value to them so that that would dis, uh, distinguish you from the rest of the people that are seeking out jobs. So you want to think about what value you can bring to the table. Um, the, second, uh, the second thing, that's for your networking. And then the second thing that you need to uh, uh, think about during this time, and this is not about negotiation, is um, you know, just accepting that it is going to be a longer process at this time, just because of the nature of it and everything else that is going on. So you need to remain positive yourself uh, as you go through that. And when uh, the other party that, you know, if they have interviewed you or they have had a phone call with you and you're waiting for the next step, not to get frustrated and not to kind of reach out to them in that frustration and anger, which I have seen a lot of people are doing because everyone is anxious to secure a job, uh, but it's just a, a process. It's a different process. Many do not know how to handle this, how to select the right candidate without a face-to-face -face, um, interaction. So do not put that frustration on them and continue to bring value. If you want to kind of poke them and say, oh, hey, you know, I, we had an interview, what happened? Uh, again, send something that has value to them because that is going to separate you uh, from other uh, from other people and stay away from you know the cliches the, the, don't just say the same thing that everybody is saying the same wording the same value like look for what value can you really bring and really look deep of what you have done that can help the organization during this time and moving forward and make it as personable as possible with the value that you can bring to the table so that they would be encouraged to choose you. Great, last question. Do you think employers have much appetite for negotiation during the pandemic, or do you think the expectation is that employees always say yes during the crisis? Uh, the employees or employers? Employees. Um, I, there, there is no, as I said, like uh, there is no expectation for them to be saying just yes to everything. And again, right now, because um, people are um, feeling insecure about their jobs, they are more likely to want to take more than they can handle and uh, to feel that they need to be connected uh, to their, um, you know, to their work 24 seven. Uh, but anybody like your everyone's manager is also a person with their own challenges and all of that so and sometimes in negotiation if you don't let people know they would not know that this is more than you can handle at the time so even if there is um you know if if you b believe that there is a project or there's a work that is urgent and you have to uh, give it more attention and you are willing because uh, of the circumstances 
for the project, you're willing to put more time in it, uh, I would strongly encourage you to have that communication uh, with your uh, employer of what you're doing, how you're doing, and that uh, if you are putting the extra time for them to know, because they don't know what they don't know. And uh, to just say yes, all you're going to get is just more work because they don't know. Uh, we have to trust that everybody is more understanding now of what's happening. Uh, while there are work that's critical that needs to get done, we should uh, be able to have that open communication to let them know that this is what's happening. And even if you do take on the extra work, that they are aware you are taking on the extra work and putting in more hours than you usually would. Okay. So our final question for today. So now we will wrap up. So thank you again, Hanye, for leading this discussion today um, and to everyone who participated in the webinar. We hope you were all able to take a few things away from today's discussion. And again, we would really appreciate your feedback through a survey we will be sending out this afternoon. If you are interested in registering for our next webinars, please keep an eye out for future emails and check back to our website. Um, so that's it. So thank you to everyone and take care.